Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Thrissur. In this session, we will be dealing with the second week of intrauterine life. Have you heard about a term known as hydatidiform mole or otherwise it is known as molar pregnancy? What do you mean by a molar pregnancy? If you look inside the uterine cavity, you will be seeing many vesicles filled with fluid. And this is known as molar pregnancy or hydatidiform mole. And this is actually considered as a gestational trophoblastic disease. Gestational trophoblastic disease means a disease arising from the trophoblast layer. It is actually a non-viable fertilized egg. The fertilization has happened but this egg is not viable. The trophoblastic tissue is actually present but in the absence of female pronuclei. So, there is no contribution from the female part. So, female pronuclei is absent but trophoblastic tissue is present. So, that means the paternal genes are regulating the development of trophoblast. That is the reason why even after fertilization, even after the missing of the female pronuclei, you are getting the trophoblast. That is the reason and the reason behind the trophoblastic tissue is the paternal genes are responsible for the development of trophoblast. So, such a condition is known as hydatidiform mole or molar pregnancy. So, in order to know the details of molar pregnancy, we need to know what are the events happening during the second week of intrauterine life. We have discussed about the first week and we have seen how an implantation is happening and the implantation will be completed by roughly say 12th day after fertilization. So, this is the entire endometrium, entire endometrium which is uh, starting from the innermost lining you call it as stratum compactum, then you have this region as stratum spongiosum, then you have the stratum basale. So, you can see that the implantation is happening in the functional layer that is the initial two layers, the stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum. And once the developing zygote is completely within the endometrium, we say that the implantation has been completed and this happens usually roughly about 12th day after fertilization. So, there should be one point of entry for the zygote. That penetration site when the implantation is completed is plugged with a fibrin plug. So, that defect is actually closed by a fibrin plug. Now, the developing zygote is entirely within the endometrial wall. Now, we, when we have a closer look, the inner cell mass is actually redefined as embryoblast. This will become bilaminar. Bilaminar means it will be having two layers. So, bilaminar germ disc is formed during the second week of intrauterine period. So, the embryoblast or the inner cell mass is actually getting converted into a bilaminar germ disc. So, the bilaminar germ disc has got an epiblast, the tall columnar cells and a hypoblast, the lower layer is known as hypoblast which is made up of cuboidal cells. So, there is an epiblast and a hypoblast. So, the embryoblast give rise to a bilaminar germ disc made up of epiblast which is lined by columnar cells and hypoblast which is made up of cuboidal cells. That is what is happening during the second week of intrauterine period to the embryoblast. At the same time simultaneously you have the extra embryonic structures developing. So, which are the extra embryonic structures developing simultaneously with the development of bilamina germ disc? They are the amniotic cavity, you can see the amniotic cavity at the upper part. Then you can see the yolk sac, yolk sac is seen below the bilaminar germ disc, it is otherwise called 
umbilical vesicle. Then you can see the formation of amnion. The amniotic cavity will be covered by amnion. Then you can see the formation of primary villus that is the initial stages of development of placenta. So, the primary villi formation you can make out. So, all these things are outside the embryoblast. That is the reason why we call it as the extra embryonic structures formed during the second week of intrauterine period. So, the changes in the second week we can discuss it under the following headings. The first heading being the changes happening in the germ disk. So, let us see what are the changes happening in the germ disk. We know there is an inner cell mass which is redefined as the embryoblast. Now, during the second week of intrauterine period, the embryoblast is getting converted into a two layered disk that is known as the epiblast and hypoblast. So, the epiblast, let us see what do you mean by an epiblast. Epiblast is otherwise known as primary ectoderm primary ectoderm because it is giving rise to a definitive ectoderm. So, primary ectoderm is a thicker layer. It is made up of high columnar cells and this layer is actually related to a cavity known as the amniotic cavity. So, before the formation of amniotic cavity, we can have a look at the embryoblast. So, embryoblast is actually attached to the trophoblast and this point of trophoblast is known as polar trophoblast. This polar trophoblast is actually invading the endometrium during implantation. So, there is no much space between the embryoblast and trophoblast. So, what happens is the embryoblast will start gradually separating from the trophoblast creating a cavity between the embryoblast and trophoblast. That cavity is known as amniotic cavity. That is the reason why it is said that the high columnar cells, the high columnar cells will be related to a cavity formed between the embryoblast and trophoblast that is the amniotic cavity. Now, what do you mean by hypoblast? Hypoblast is otherwise known as primary endoderm. It is made up of flattened cuboidal cells. So, primary endoderm is formed by flattened cuboidal or cuboidal cells and they are adjacent to a cavity, another cavity that is known as exocelomic cavity. So, the hypoblast or primary endoderm is actually formed by flattened or cuboidal cells and they are adjacent to a cavity known as exocelomic cavity. So, before proceeding further, I would like to add one point. When we discuss the events occurring during the second week of intrauterine period, we will be coming across many structures and we can see that all structures are actually doubling or there is a rule of 2. If we have to say the rule of 2 till now, we can say that the embryoblast, till now we have discussed about the embryoblast, the embryoblast is dividing into 2 layers the epiblast and hypoblast. Likewise, we will be coming across structures which are forming as multiples of 2. That is why we say that the changes in the second week of intrauterine period follows the rule of 2. Now, again there are mainly 2 cavities formed. So, which are the 2 cavities formed? As the embryoblast gets separated from the trophoblast, there is a cavity formed above. This cavity is known as the amniotic cavity and the exocelomic cavity lying below the hypoblast you call it as yolk sac. So, this is the amniotic cavity and this is the yolk sac. So, as the embryoblast gets separated from the cytotrophoblast, an additional layer of cells are formed from the cytotrophoblast and along with the epiblast will be forming a covering for the amniotic cavity. So, the amniotic cavity is actually covered by epiblast as well as the cells arising from the cytotrophoblast. What about the yolk sac? Yolk sac is again a cavity formed by the hypoblast and the cells derived from the cytotrophoblast. So, altogether this will be covering the yolk sac. What do you get inside the amniotic cavity? The amniotic cavity contains 
a fluid known as amniotic fluid or like a amne. So, the amniotic cavity which is formed above the epiblast contains a fluid known as amniotic fluid or like a amne and it is in this amniotic fluid our fetus will be moving inside the uterine cavity. Now the epiblast adjacent to the cytotrophoblast and the cells which are derived from the cytotrophoblast will be forming the amnioblast. So the epiblast along with the cells adjacent to the cytotrophoblast we call it as amnioblast. So the amnioblast will be covering the amniotic cavity. Then there is another term known as Husserl's membrane. So Husserl's membrane is nothing but the membrane which line the inner aspect of blastocystic cavity together with the hypoblastic lining of exosilomic cavity. So Husserl's membrane is just like the amnioblast. Amnioblasts are the cells which are covering the amniotic cavity. So it, they are the cells derived from the cytotrophoblast and the Husserl's membrane is a membrane covering the yolk sac and again that is derived from the cytotrophoblast. So you have to keep one point in mind, the yolk sac which is formed now is called as primitive yolk sac. So that means you will get one more yolk sac as the development proceeds. So the primitive yolk sac is covered by a membrane known as Husserl's membrane which is again derived from the cytotrophoblast. What do you mean by extra embryonic mesoderm or primary mesoderm? So till now we were talking about the primitive ectoderm, primitive endoderm, but we did not tell anything about mesoderm. But here the formation of mesoderm is happening, but it is not between the epiblast or hypoblast. It is not between the epiblast and hypoblast. So it is not within the embryo where you are getting the mesoderm developed. That is the reason why you call it as extra embryonic mesoderm. It is outside the embryo we get the mesoderm being formed. Since this is the mesoderm which is firstly formed, you call it as primary mesoderm. And where are you going to get this primary mesoderm or extra embryonic mesoderm? As the term implies, it is nowhere inside the embryoblast. It is outside the embryoblast. So this pink colored region that is the extra embryonic mesoderm and that is actually formed between the cytotrophoblast and the amniotic cavity and yolk sac. So the idea of the extra embryonic mesoderm is to separate the trophoblast from the embryoblast and the two cavities. So there is the formation of extra embryonic mesoderm and it lies between the cytotrophoblast on one end and the rest of it that is the amniotic cavity and the yolk sac along with the embryoblast within the center. So these two are separated by a mesoderm lying in between that is known as extra embryonic mesoderm or primary mesoderm since it is formed. Now what happens is if you have a closer look so we can see the extra embryonic mesoderm very nicely and that is actually separating the cytotrophoblast from the amniotic cavity and yolk sac. So the pink colored thing is the newly formed extra embryonic mesoderm or primary mesoderm. Now if you have a closer look you can see smaller smaller cavities developing within the extra embryonic mesoderm. These cavities are known as extra embryonic cavity or chorionic cavity. What do you call this? These are known as extra embryonic cavity or chorionic cavity. Now the chorionic cavity is actually surrounding the primitive yolk sac and amniotic cavity. So the chorionic cavity in the beginning they are just smaller smaller cavities. Later they will coalesce to form a larger cavity. You can see that all these smaller smaller cavities join together to form a larger cavity that is known as extra embryonic cavity since it is formed in the extra embryonic mesoderm it is otherwise known as chorionic cavity. But just imagine if this cavity is just expanding like this and completely encircling the embryoblast what will happen? Then there won't be any connection with the cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. 
the entire thing will be just floating like an island. Is it possible? It is not possible because there should be some connection for the embryoblast with the trophoblast because it needs nutrition. Once the yolk sac and the amniotic cavity gets depleted, it needs nutrition for the further development of the embryo. That is made possible with the help of trophoblast which is actually developing as the placenta. So we cannot have this entire cavity going around the yolk sac and amniotic cavity but it should be still connected to the trophoblast. So that connection is known as the connecting stock. So can you see? We can see that the smaller smaller cavities are coalescing with each other until it has become a larger cavity but it is not extending completely. There is a smaller portion left without the invasion of the cavity. So this connection which still connects the embryoblast with the trophoblast is known as the connecting stock. And what is the role of connecting stock? When the blood vessels develop, this will act as a conduit for the blood vessels to enter into the developing embryoblast. And this will be forming the future umbilical cord. So that is what is happening with the development of extra embryonic cavity or chorionic cavity. We have already seen that there is a primitive yolk sac and we can see that with the formation of the chorionic cavity a part of the yolk sac is actually pinched off from the primitive yolk sac by the pull of the developing mesoderm, extra embryonic mesoderm. We will come to it later, please have a look at this point. The primitive yolk sac, the larger one is actually shrinking and made in, into a smaller one by pinching off a portion of the primitive sac by the mesoderm. So we will come to it. For the time being, the connecting stock is developing as the umbilical cord in future. The extra embryonic mesoderm again will be following the rule of two because the events are occurring in the second week of intrauterine period. So again the extra embryonic mesoderm will be following the rule of two. That is it is split into two layers. We can call it as the somatopleuric layer and the splanchnopleuric layer of the extra embryonic mesoderm. Somatopleuric layer and splanchnopleuric layer of extra embryonic mesoderm. These are the two layers formed during the second week of intrauterine period. So the somatopleuric layer is otherwise known as parietal extra embryonic mesoderm. So you can see the somatopleuric or the parietal layer of extra embryonic mesoderm and this is actually seen closer to the trophoblast. Which is trophoblast? This is the cytotrophoblast, isn't it? So closer to the cytotrophoblast, the extra embryonic mesoderm lying. That is called the somatopleuric or parietal extra embryonic mesoderm. Along with that, the mesoderm which is covering the amniotic cavity, there is a smaller portion of mesoderm lying closer to the amniotic cavity. Can you see? So this is also called parietal or somatopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm. So where will you get the next layer of mesoderm? The next layer is known as visceral or splanchnopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm. So the extra embryonic mesoderm is divided into two during the second week of intrauterine period as following the rule of two. Somatopleuric which is lying closer to the cytotrophoblast and covering the amniotic cavity and the next one is visceral or splanchnopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm. So where will you get the visceral or uh, splanchnopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm? This will be actually confined. We can see that this is actually confined to the yolk sac. So the extra embryonic mesoderm which is seen in close relation with the yolk sac this alone is called as the splanchnopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm or visceral layer of extra embryonic mesoderm. Now as the mesoderm is formed, we have already mentioned that a part of the primitive yolk sac is being pulled off. That will result in the shrinkage of the primitive yolk sac and the newly formed cavity or the newly formed yolk sac. This is a newly formed yolk sac and you can see 
a small pinched off portion actually it is not small it is a bigger portion which is pinched off from the primitive yolk sac lying in the extra embryonic mesoderm because it is a mesoderm which has pulled the part of the primitive yolk sac. So this newly formed primitive yolk sac is known as secondary yolk sac or definitive yolk sac. So the primitive yolk sac is actually converted into secondary yolk sac or definitive yolk sac by pinching off a larger portion of the yolk sac by the mesoderm. So again yolk sac is also following the rule of two. There is formation of two yolk sacs. One is the primitive yolk sac and the other one is secondary yolk sac or definitive yolk sac. Then by the end of 13th day after fertilization, we are in the second week, right? So by the end of 13th day, two yolk sac are formed. One is the primitive yolk sac. Later it degenerates by pinching off a larger portion and the next one formed is known as the secondary yolk sac or definitive yolk sac. Now just focus on the somatopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm. What will you call the entire wall which is formed by the somatopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm, the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast? What will you call this together? If you make a tie and if you include the somatopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm, the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast, what will you call this tie? That is known as chorion. So chorion means the somatopleuric mesoderm along with the cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. So we have the villi now developing in this region. So since the villi is arising from this chorion, the villi will be known as chorionic villi. So everywhere throughout you will be getting the formation of chorionic villi. So chorionic villi is named so because the chorion is actually the combination or uh, the trophoblast along with the extraembryonic mesoderm and the villi arising from it you will call it as chorionic villi. Again due to the formation of the extraembryonic mesoderm the amnion, the yolk sac and the chorion are following the rule of two. What is the rule of two? Till the formation of extraembryonic mesoderm we were seeing only one layer for the amnion, we were seeing only this layer, we were seeing only one layer for the uh, yolk sac and we were seeing only one layer for the cytotrophoblast. But with the formation of the extra embryonic mesoderm, all these things are double layered. Double layered means if just if you consider the chorion, what is happening? There is an additional layer added to the cytotrophoblast, so it is double layered. What is ha happening to the amnion along with the amnioblast you are getting an additional layer provided by the extra embryonic mesoderm. Likewise if you concentrate on the yolk sac what is happening along with the Husserl's membrane you are getting the extra embryonic mesoderm. So I would like to add one more point. The Husserl's membrane is the term used to line the primitive yolk sac and it is derived from the cytotrophoblast but once a smaller portion of the primitive yolk sac is pinched off, the remaining cells are actually derived from the hypoplast in order to complete the yolk sac which is the definitive yolk sac. So the definitive yolk sac is actually lined by the cells arising from the hypoplast. So the yolk sac is also having another one more layer from the splanchnopleuric extra embryonic mesoderm. So the amnion, the chorion and the yolk sac all will be two layered with the splitting of the extra embryonic mesoderm into two layers. We have the amnion and when we discuss about the amnion it is actually having a contribution from the ectoderm and it is having mesoderm as well. This is the chorion and when we discuss about the yolk sac again it is having a derivative from the endoderm and it is having a mesoderm as well. Okay, Just a comparison, this is ectodermal, the amnion is more of ectodermal since it is seen in relation with the ectoderm and the yolk sac is more of endodermal since it is seen in relation with the endoderm and this is the chorionic part. 
which includes the trophoblast and the extraembryonic mesoderm. The next heading will be what are the changes happening for the trophoblast. Trophoblast, the trophob means nutrition. So the trophoblast layer is actually giving a protective and nutritive role for the extra for the embryoblast. So the trophoblast will be giving rise to the formation of placenta. So what are the changes you expect for the trophoblast during the second week of in uterine period? Again, trophoblast follows the rule of two. What is the rule of two? Trophoblast will be differentiated as cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. So where will you get cytotrophoblast and where will you get syncytiotrophoblast? Cytotrophoblast will be seen towards the inner aspect and syncytiotrophoblast will be seen towards the outer aspect. So cytotrophoblast is just a single layer of cells that is mitotically active. Can you see? It is just a single layer of cells and outer to it you have the syncytiotrophoblast. So syncytiotrophoblast outer to it, it is actually a multinucleated mass with no cell boundaries. So this is the syncytiotrophoblast. It is actually a multinucleated mass with no cell boundaries. And the syncytiotrophoblast actually displays the endometrial cells at the implantation site. As the syncytiotrophoblast layer is formed, it will actually help to displace the cells in the endometrium during the implantation period. So you can see the blue colored thing is the syncytiotrophoblast and inner to it you can see the cytotrophoblast. Syncytiotropho cytotrophoblast when you have a closer look you can clearly make out the cell membrane so that it, it is a uninucleate cell. But when you have a closer look at the syncytiotrophoblast you can see that you are not able to make out the cell membrane or the cell boundary and it is just filled with nuclei. The word syncytium means multinucleated. So because of this reason, this trophoblast is known as syncytiotrophoblast. Now as the implantation proceeds, the endometrial cells will undergo apoptosis. That is because of the invasion of the syncytiotrophoblast, the endometrial cells will undergo apoptosis. Now what are the events occurring in the syncytiotrophoblast? We can see that again many smaller cavities are developing within the syncytiotrophoblast. Can you see? These smaller cavities are formed within the syncytiotrophoblast and these spaces are known as lacuna spaces, lacuna spaces. So because of the formation of the lacuna spaces at this point of time this stage of the developing embryo is known as lacuna stage. As the lacuna spaces are formed, you can see that there is some syncytiotrophoblast lying between the lacuna spaces, isn't it? If you consider these two lacuna spaces, there is a bit of syncytiotrophoblast lying between the two lacuna spaces. These are known as trabeculae. So trabeculae are nothing but the syncytiotrophoblast lying between the lacuna spaces. And why you need a lacuna spaces? It is into this lacuna space you have the invasion of the spiral endometrial vessels. So the spiral endometrial vessels will start invading the developing embryo and the lacunar spaces will be soon filled with maternal blood. By, and this is actually happening by the rupture of the endometrial capillaries. Actually the fluid in the lacuna spaces is known as embryotroph. Again the word meaning of trough is nutrition. So the embryotroph is so called because it passes the nutrition to the embryo by a mechanism known as diffusion because there is no blood vessel formed at this stage. So there is no blood vessel to carry the blood or the nutrition to the developing embryo. So it just happens by a process known as diffusion until the placenta is formed. So once the lacuna spaces are filled with blood, you can say that the utero-placental circulation is established. This is the sign of establishment of primordial utero-placental circulation because there is a circulation 
established between the uterus and the placenta. This portion is actually giving rise to the future placenta and this portion is actually belonging to the uterus. So when the uterine endometrial capillaries burst into the lacuna spaces, the lacuna spaces will be filled with blood and this is actually a sign of establishment of primordial uteroplacental circulation. Now we have the oxygenated blood as well as the deoxygenated blood. So the oxygenated blood will be carried by the spiral endometrial arteries and the deoxygenated blood or the poorly oxygenated blood will be carried by the endometrial veins. When the maternal blood starts passing through the lacuna spaces or the trophoblastic system as we say, we can say that it is the establishment of uteroplacental circulation. We have already mentioned about what you mean by trabeculae. Trabeculae are nothing but the syncytial trophoblast lying between the lacuna spaces. During the second week again, there is the formation of primary chorionic villi. We know that uh, there is chorion formation. Chorion is nothing but the trophoblast along with the extraembryonic mesoderm. So, if there is proliferation of cells from the chorion, you can call it as chorionic villi. So, chorionic villi according to development is again classified into primary chorionic villi, secondary chorionic villi, tertiary and likewise. So, tertiary will be finally becoming a mature villi. So, the primary chorionic villi formation happens during the second week of intrauterine period. So, how is it made possible? We have the trabeculae that is the syncytial trophoblast lying between the lacuna spaces. Into the trabeculae, we have the cytotrophoblast cells which will be proliferating. So, that is actually the primary chorionic villi. So, if you take, if you just imagine you are taking a cut section at this level, what will you see? In the center, you will be seeing cytotrophoblast and in the periphery, you will be getting the syncytial trophoblast. That is what is meant by a primary chorionic villi. So, the proliferation of cells since it is happening from the chorion, you call it as chorionic villi. So, from the cytotrophoblast, the cells will be proliferating into the trabeculae. Trabeculae is nothing but the syncytial trophoblast lying between the lacuna spaces. So, if you take a cut section at this level, in the center you will be getting cytotrophoblast and surrounded by you have the syncytial trophoblast. So, this is known as primary chorionic villi and this is the first stage of development of placental villi. Now, as the primary villi is formed, the lacuna spaces are now redefined as intervillous spaces. Just see this lacuna space, you have a villi on one side and you have a villi on the other side. These are the primary chorionic villi. So, what will you call the space lying between the two villi? It is known as intervillous space. So, up to the formation of the primary chorionic villi, you have called these spaces as lacuna spaces, but after the formation of chorionic villi, you call the same lacuna space as intervillous space and the formation of primary villi is said to be the first stage in the development of chorionic villi of placenta. So, we have discussed about the changes happening in the embryoblast, we have discussed about the changes happening in the trophoblast. Now, we have to see what is happening to the endometrium because it is in the endometrium we have all these events happening. So, let us see what is happening in the endometrium. Endometrium, the main reaction is known as the decidual reaction. So, what do you mean by decidual reaction? As the implantation proceeds, the cells of the endometrium will swell up and it will be filled with glycogen and lipid, isn't it? So, such cells are known as decidual cells. So, the cells of the endometrium will be swollen due to the presence of glycogen and lipid and such cells are known as decidual cells. And what is the role of decidual cells? Again, they provide nutrition to the early embryo because until a placenta is fully formed, the embryo should get continuous nutrition. So, it will make use of all the possibilities. So, for that purpose, the endometrium is actually getting modified as decidua. Then the immunologically privileged 
site for the conceptus is another option provided by the decidua. We know that there are three layers for the endometrium that is stratum compactum, stratum spongiosum and stratum basal. Stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum together you call it as stratum functional and stratum basal is the layer which will be actually replacing the lost stratum functional during menstruation. So the implantation will be happening again in the stratum functional layer. So the blastocyst after implantation will be lying in the stratum compactum layer. So the mainly the stratum compactum will be having the implanted blastocyst. The endometrium surrounding the conceptus and the lining of the uterine cavity. So you have the endometrium, a part of endometrium surrounding the conceptus and the rest of the endometrium which is lining the remaining uterine cavity because this event will be happening only in a part of the upper uterine segment. But the rest of the uterus will be lined by endometrium. But after the implantation is over, the endometrium will be redesignated as decidua. So what are the different parts of decidua or how is endometrium redefined as decidua? The point at which the embryoblast is getting attached that is called decidua basalis. So that is the embryonic pole of the blastocyst. So this is the entire endometrial wall in which the embryo is implanted. So you can see that the uterine cavity is actually made into a very narrow lumen because you have the implanted embryo in the wall of the uterus and as the embryo grows out it will be just occupying the uterine cavity. So the uterine lumen will be made very smaller. So you can see the part of the endometrium to which the blastocyst is implanted. This is known as decidua basalis. What will you call the rest of the endometrium covering the ab embryonic pole? You can see a rim of endometrium which is covering the rest of the ab embryonic pole. That is known as decidua capsularis. So decidua basalis it is at the point of embryonic pole. The rest of the ab embryonic pole is covered by decidua capsularis. And still you have the endometrium lining the rest of the uterine lumen, isn't it? So the rest of the uterine lumen, the endometrium which is lining is called as decidua parietalis. So after the implantation, the endometrium is redefined as decidua basalis, decidua capsularis and decidua parietalis. Decidua basalis, it is the part of the endometrium to which the embryonic pole is attached. The rest of the embryonic pole covering will be known as decidua capsularis and the remaining endometrium which will be lining the uterine cavity, you will be calling it as decidua parietalis. So let us summarize the events happening in the second week of intrauterine period. I have already mentioned that it is actually following the rule of two. So first rule it is applicable to the embryoblast. How is it applicable? It is forming two layers that is the epiblast and hypoblast. So the, by the formation of epiblast and hypoblast, we are having a bilamina germ disc during the second week of intrauterine period. Now again it is applicable to the trophoblast. How is it applicable? The trophoblast is differentiating as again two layers the inner cytotrophoblast and the outer syncytiotrophoblast. The rule of two is applicable to yolk sac. How? There are two yolk sacs formed in the second week. First one is the primitive or primary yolk sac and as a portion of it is pinched off by the developing extra embryonic mesoderm, you are getting another yolk sac that is known as secondary yolk sac or definitive yolk sac. So two yolk sacs are formed. Then you have two new cavities formed, which are the two new cavities. You have the amniotic cavity above the epiblast and you have the chorionic cavity. So these are the two cavities formed apart from the yolk sac. So the amniotic cavity and the chorionic cavity formed. 
Then the extra embryonic mesoderm, extra embryonic mesoderm is the mesoderm lying between the cytotrophoblast and the developing embryoblast. So the extra embryonic mesoderm actually with the help of formation of chorionic cavity. So as the chorionic cavity is formed, the extra embryonic mesoderm is again split up into two. Again it form allows the rule of two to be applicable to the extra embryonic mesoderm. So what is the rule of two? In extra, as far as the extra embryonic mesoderm is concerned, it is forming the somatopleuric layer as well as the splanchnopleuric layer. Then another rule which can, we can apply after the formation of extra embryonic mesoderm is the amnion, the yolk sac and the chorion are becoming double layered. So again rule of two. How is it becoming double layered? Just have a look at the extra embryonic mesoderm. As it is formed, it is forming a layer just next to the cytotrophoblast. So this layer is, the chorion is actually double layered. The extra embryonic mesoderm is actually forming a layer just next to the amnion. So the amnion is also becoming double layered. The extra embryonic mesoderm is also forming a layer just nearer to the yolk sac. So the lining of the yolk sac is also becoming double layered. So all these are double layered due to the formation of extra embryonic mesoderm. So this is the rule of two which is followed during the second week of intrauterine period. So we started with a abnormal presentation that is the formation of hydatidiform mold or what is meant by molar pregnancy. It is a gestational trophoblastic disease because it is arising purely from the trophoblast. And here we have the fertilized egg but it is not viable. And the trophoblastic tissue is actually present but female pronuclei is absent. So in the absence of female pronuclei, you have the trophoblastic tissue proliferating. That condition is actually known as hydatidiform mold. So what is responsible for the proliferation of the trophoblast? It is said that the paternal genes regulate the development of trophoblast. So that is the reason why we are getting the trophoblastic proliferation even in the absence of female pronucleus. And uh, when we consider the hydratidiform mold, there are mainly two types of mold. One is called partial mold and the other one is called complete mold. So when will you call it as partial mold and uh, when will you call it as complete mold? So let us see one option. Let us discuss about complete mold. So complete mold is formed when an empty ovum that is there is no genetic material inside this ovum is getting fused with a single sperm. So what will be happening? This sperm will undergo a duplication, chromosomal duplication. So ultimately the chromosome number will be 46XX that is just because of the duplication of the sperm but the egg, uh, the ovum is empty. So that is known as homozygous complete mold. There is another option that is called, this condition is again called a complete mold, but here you call it as heterozygous complete mold. How, when will you call it as heterozygous complete mold? You have the empty ovum, but here the empty ovum is actually fertilized by two sperms that is called dispermy. So you have two options either the X will fuse, two X will fuse or an X and a Y will fuse. So it is a heterozygous complete mold. Homozygous means the same sperm is actually duplicating and forming the mold. So it is homozygous. But in case of heterozygous you have two sperms fusing with an empty ovum. So there is no genetic material within the empty ovum. That condition is known as heterozygous complete mold. Now we have just mentioned about partial mold. So what do you mean by partial mold? In case of partial mold you have the ovum with the genetic material that is a haploid number. You have the sperm but this time you have two sperms. So what will happen if two sperms fertilize a single ovum? You will get a triploid set. So that condition is known as triploid partial mold and it is said to be very rare. 
So the partial mole and the complete mole. This is how a hydatidiform mole or a molar pregnancy happens. So that is all about the second week of intrauterine life in a nutshell. Thanks for watching.